have been asked for a provocation, um, which see, feels dangerous somehow. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to talk a little bit about abundance. And I'm going to talk about sort of where I sit inside of it and sort of give some of the ideas that some of them are in the book, but they're about the things that, that I think about whenever I look at this conversation. So I'm Dave. I've been, um, how do you describe what I do? Uh, I do a lot of weird projects. Uh, my current title includes the term special projects at the end of it, which is kind of what I do. I've been in communications. I've been teaching since 1998. Um, and so this question of how, all of this technology business changes what it means for us to learn as people. It's the thing that really interests me the most. Not so much like I don't care about the technology for itself, but it's really changed our access. It's changed the way that things come at us. It changed the way that corporations can come at us. It changes all kinds of things about how we can go about learning. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So starting question, how do we confront uncertainty in a time of information abundance? So when I think of information literacy, I think of us having something that's uncertain and then trying to figure it out, trying to deal with it, trying to solve it, depending on the situation. So that's sort of the guiding question for what I want to talk about today. So I'll talk a little bit about abundance. I'll talk a little bit about uncertainty. And then I'll give you the sort of three guidelines that I try to hold myself to mostly successfully, but not always, particularly when I get riled up. So uh, Mike Caulfield would tell us that whenever you feel emotional about something, you need to slow down and sort of take a look at it a little bit more. So I try my best to hold to these. Um, but uh, it's a best effort kind of situation. So the argument starts here with the idea that information used to be really hard to come by. Um, this particular document um, probably cost the lives of a hundred or so sheep. Um, you know, the skins of the sheep have to take the skins and put them together and whatever else. And then some poor soul is sitting in a building with bad lighting sort of copying out the thing that went on before these things are incredibly precious they're incredibly hard to come by and because they were so people had to come together into spaces to learn from them right and it's always kind of been that way if you look at this is from the a school in nippur in mesopotamia um it was a school that uh burned uh, which is terrible for the school but good for us because we have all the records of what happened inside of it and what you're looking at is two kinds of learning you've got two scales of learning. The first one, students are memorizing how to make the cuneiform, like what pokes make what words, and then stories. And there's somewhere between 10 or 14 stories. The Epic of Gilgamesh happens to be one of those. Some of them are a little odd, but your job in the school was to come out with knowing what all the pokies were to make all the right words, and then knowing those stories so you could pass them along. And that made total sense for the information context that they're in. I mean, they were inventing writing it wrong inventing they were one of the people who invented writing so knowing what the words are and knowing those stories was the critical thing that you had to come out that was the information that you needed to come out of the school with this is one of my favorite quotes from the history of schooling it's from 1229 um those who wish to scrutinize the bosom of nature to the inmost can hear the books of aristotle which were forbidden at paris so a couple of things there one toulouse and paris are not that close to each other uh, there were no cars. That's a long walk uh, to get from one school to the other. But the, the magic word here is here. So you would go to the school so you could listen to the book, right? That was the access you had to the book. Now, there are some libraries in some places where that wasn't the case. But for the average student, you were not putting your paws, your grimy paws on this precious book, right? So information is super scarce. We bring everybody together into one place and then one person reads off the book so you can hear Aristotle it's Aristotle's physics in this case, which was ba was banned at the University of Paris. This is how my father learned. So my father was uh, a farmer in northern New Brunswick, uh, which is the middle of nowhere um, in uh, in on the east coast of Canada. And his uncle Cetus used to bring him popular science magazines about once a year whenever he came up to visit. And the only access my father had to new ideas and new things he could do on the farm was either the people next door, they didn't have a lot of new ideas, um, or these magazines. And he uh, had them, each one for a year, each one was precious, and he was limited to what he could find inside of them. Um, but he always talked fondly about 
these magazines and how his life would change every time they came in because there'd be like these were really cool the ones from the 50s they had um like little tasks you could do and little projects you could run and what you can do with a coat hanger um but they were they opened up his world in a way that his neighbors thought he was crazy because he had all these ideas but he got a lot of them for himself but a lot of them came out of his access that he had to this one sort of window of information so for me um i would have been the sleeping student in the front end i was a terrible student in my undergrad um but no matter how terrible i was i still had to go to the library and i still had to go and find a book and do the dewey card thing and then go find the little number and then go up into the book and find the books and put them on the table and open the book and realize this isn't the book i need and go back and put the book back and whatever i had to go through that process i would have done anything to avoid it but I had to do it. There was no question. Like I learned from people, but I also had a lot more books than my father did, but I was still sort of limited in that, that access that I could have in the sense that I had to go and use the systems that were out there that were designed around it. And like, can you imagine now thinking about an all about upholstering book, like an all about anything book, like the idea that you can find a book that would tell you something, any of these concepts. Like if you look at Something like uh, an ob observational astrophysicist is a job now. 2,000 years ago, that was called a philosopher. Then it was called a scientist. Then it was called a physicist. Then it was called an astrophysicist. And now it's an observational astrophysicist. Right? We've got increasing specialization. Tons and tons and tons and tons of information coming at us from everywhere. Right? We, But our schools were designed to solve that other problem they're designed to solve the problem of scarcity we have one person who stands up in front of the room there's an established curriculum that we need to give you and we're going to make sure you get that rare information that we need and i don't mean that everybody teaches that way i mean that our education system is structured that way do you have the right answer have you won the game of school right have you figured out the thing that you were meant to figure out so i like to think of it as um you know the teacher shows okay. you the information. Okay. Yes. Can you stop one second? I just have a captioning issue. If oh, somebody okay. the, the captions, as you may have noticed, are going bonkers for no reason. If you are having an issue and you need the captions, another option for you is that you could join this Zoom and stream the captions on your own computer. It might work better. So if you'd like to do that, um, send Martha an email. Send Martha an email and she'll hit you with that zoom link she's thinking she's thinking send hannah mallon an email and we will get you it um we still have them up here but i they if you're really depending on them it's probably a challenge for you right now so um send hannah mallon an email she'll send you the zoom link and you can join and you will not be represented on there so okay sorry dave all is well on your end hi dave shall we give it a minute just to give people a chance to send that email I think not. Um, I, you know, the captions here are working. They're just <laughs> there's a lag, and then they catch up. So you have to be reading reading real fast. So, um, so I think we're good. And we will also provide uh, slide decks and all that stuff later as well. All right. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead. No, yeah, perfect. So, the system is designed for scarcity. We have this set amount of information you need to give. I'm going to give that set amount of information. I'm going to check to see if it's done. Well, obviously, people teach outside of this, but the system kind of leads you in that direction. And then we've got this thing. And I don't necessarily just mean Google, but like somewhere between 1998 and 2005, we went from finding information in books to finding them online. We went from having to go through this long established decades, so in some cases, centuries old process of going through books and compiling information or talking to our neighbor and figuring out how that works to having this ability to just go and getting an answer to something. And there's all kinds of problems with that in terms of the way we get answers and, and how that process happens. But I wanna talk about one problem. I wanna talk about one of these impact of all this abundance out there and how the process we access, that we access information changes the way that we actually do learning business. I was doing a presentation four or five months ago, and we we're in the midst of talking about something similar to this. And one of the students, who's a PhD student, um, who is taking a, is a facilitator's course, and she's going to be teaching that fall or the next fall. And she goes, hold on a second here. 
you guys are saying that I need to read the articles that I cite. I don't see that written down anywhere. See, and this is her talking. See, what you have told me to do is cite my argument. And I'll tell you how I do that. I go to Google Scholar. I do a search for the thing I might need to prove my argument. I find an article. I pull up that article. I hit Control F, find, or Command F for those Mac users out there. And I go through and I find that piece. I copy and paste it and I throw it into my article. Or I rewrite that one sentence and I cite it and I'm done. Often I don't read the paragraph it's in. I definitely do not read the article. It's and I was like, and you could just see like four people in the room free solid. And so we started asking her, she's like, we're like, what we want you to do is, is like understand the field. Like the whole purpose of this is not for you to support your argument. It's to understand what's going on. It's to, to get a deeper understanding to maybe move from literacy to fluency, whatever that happens to be. But we're looking for you to dig in deeper. And she's like, doesn't say that anywhere contract we have as martha said earlier the game of school here is you've told me to make an argument and support that argument the fact that the technology allows me to get around what you want is not my fault that's your fault and it's one of those times where you just see a student totally put their feet in the ground and just lay it out and she's right that's the case the vast majority of the syllabi certainly in her department say make an argument support the argument doesn't say anything about what she's supposed to do, but the abundance of information, the abundance of access, the fact that these technologies work the way they do means she doesn't have to read anything. All she needs to do is make an argument and support that argument. And if you think about it, that kid that I said when I was in the library sleeping earlier, I could get away. I couldn't get away with doing that. I couldn't make an argument and then find a way to support it because it was, well, I tried. It's exhausting. Right, you go around the library, find a book that doesn't support my argument, that doesn't support my argument, that doesn't support my argument. And eventually you learn, you know, if I just read one of these books and took the argument from it, this would be an awful lot easier. Which, uh, talking to my colleague last night, is what she's trying to teach her students to do. But the abundance means that the students don't have to, the way we've got the sit -up system set up. So one example. But the move from information scarcity to information abundance fundamentally affects what and how we learn. So that's that's sort of the premise here. The how to write an essay piece is one example. There are thousands of others. Okay, phase two. We're looking to face un uncertainty inside of all of this abundance, right? And in some ways, the abundance is awesome. So I spent years i figure in real time as a child trying to understand the lyrics to various things i'm not very good at picking up the words from songs and so like many folks i had a lot of misunderstandings i still hear songs now where i'm like oh i try to figure it out and i'm like oh yeah quick type oh those are the lyrics i haven't known them for 35 years and now i do so in that sense abundance is fantastic is like i can just get the answer isn't that great if it's a fact and if it has an easy answer, which is not the case for all of us. So my example for today on this is vitamin C. So six months ago, my kid comes home from her geography class saying, my teacher told me that vitamins don't work. And I'm like, my partner happens to be um, a vitamin hander outer. And so this created a certain amount of conflict in my house. So if you try to track this down, and just take vitamin C, for example, you take vitamin C down, you end up finding this man, Linus Pauling. And again, abundance, right? I'm searching for it. And there's lots of opinions. And there's people who say this guy said was taking up to 18,000 milligrams a day, which I mean, I, I assumed he turned orange, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Vitamin C turns you orange. doesn't matter. So confronting this kind of situation, not is it, but should I? Right. And I think when it when you start talking about information literacy, should eyes are the real issue. Facts are great. We can find them. And I love the fact I have access to them. But it's, how do you deal with the shoulds? Right. How do we get into this place to make decisions about things we're genuinely uncertain about? So quick cursory glance, you'll see a bunch of research that says vitamin C doesn't work. Certainly this guy's perspective that it will help you live 25 years longer. I, I, pretty comfortable, not the case, right? And then we're looking at this stuff. It's the, the first process, step in this process is weed out the stuff that's obviously not true. 
when you dig in a little bit deeper, it turns out that the consensus sort of suggests that if you take vitamin C every day, your colds will last 8% less, will be 8% uh, shorter, and maybe not as bad. And so you're left asking yourself, should I do it? Right. So you can do all this information searching and you do the cross-referencing and you go and read the, the popular article like this Vox article. And then you go and track down the research after and then you sort of cross-reference it all and then you make a decision. It's exhausting because that's one of the vitamins. That's not even all the rest of them. That took me a half an hour of my time trying to find one piece of information about one vitamin of the 12 that we're debating. And this is the problem with abundance, right, is that. My father had a really hard time accessing information, but he only had so many things that he was able to decide upon. Whereas we have all of this information, but not all the time we would need to use all the information available. So the big thing here, and I think the thing to remember whenever we're actually doing this thing in Flight of Abundance is that the vast majority of real questions, actual real world questions have a little bit of both. They have some of the simple things. They have some facts about them, like the fact that vitamin C is like where it comes from or like, I don't know, I keep saying color. I don't know why I think vitamin C has color, but it also has a bunch of opinions, a bunch of judgments, a bunch of interpretations and a bunch of other things that are not necessarily things that are going to be true or false. And whenever we do decision making inside of all this abundance, we're always kind of meshing between the two. We've always got to kind of make that judgment, which is which. So I was given 20 minutes. I'm going to hopefully come right in in time here. I have three, we'll call them recommendations. Three things, like I said, that I try to hold myself to whenever I'm doing this. The first, and I think I literally absolutely think that this is the most important 21st century literacy. It's humility. It's about walking into a process and not going, I know, or not going, I have this information or not showing, I'm sure, but rather having that humble approach to the information. And it's a particularly important when we're doing this as citizens, when we're doing this on important issues, things that information we've inherited, all the rest of this stuff, that humility is a, is a vital first step in the process. So not, I can't know, but I don't know now. I, I'm not sure. I have these perspectives I'm starting from. I have these sort of things I've inherited that I'm bringing forward with, but I'm going to be open-minded about the process. The second one is how we trust. And this one's super hard. So I'm actually a huge believer in Wikipedia. I know you guys are going to use a little bit of that today. And I'm a big believer in Wikipedia for two reasons. One, there are lots of eyes on it and it updates itself. So it sort of moves forward. And two, because of the talk pages, it has extra stuff in there that can give you some of the context. And I should say three, there are a bunch of links there as well. So I'm a huge believer in trusting Wikipedia, but I'm trusting it to be Wikipedia. I'm not trusting it to act like a journal article, which I also don't trust. I understand that it's written by somebody who has a bias and who has perspectives and whatever else, and I understand it that way. But it's not so much what we trust, but how we do it. And I think that's the second sort of piece that I advise people to do. And the third piece is about choosing with our values. And this is a this is a tricky one, but I think it's really important that when we approach any of these shoulds, when we approach these things we're trying to decide upon, and I don't mean in the artificial classroom style of uh, a classroom style question where there's a right answer or whatever else, but real actual decisions that we make where we're going out to find information to decide about our world, that we bring our values along with us because a lot of these decisions are value-based decisions. So I always, I use the example all the way through the book about climate change. There are a lot of value-based decisions. There's a lot of science decisions, a lot of facts in there, but some of them are just about what you value more one or the other, right? Or how our values impact the things that may be less advantageous to us financially, for instance, but more important to us from our moral perspective, right? So I think that's those three pieces. And just one last note, Abundance is exhausting, right? There is so much out there and so many things to look at and so many things to understand. Um, these are two articles from the Chronicle talking about how people can't keep their focus or their attention. I've watched it in my students in class readings where they're like, oh, I just, I got the sense of it now. We had this conversation with my students uh, this term. It's the last day of class. 
and I had them read an article in the New York Times from 1977 about televisions and their impact on learning and how kids these days are walking around in a daze and they don't sleep anymore because they're just staying up and watching TV and they don't know how to play in the yard anymore. And when you look at the camp playground, kids don't know how to play anymore. You'll recognize some of these arguments are familiar. Um, and my students were like, they got one of them particularly got through about mm, two minutes of this 1500 word article. And she's like, oh, I can see you're doing one of these and the stretching and the, oh, I can't. And I'm like, Isabel, are you uh, having a hard time getting to that article? She's like, ah, it's too long. I get the point of it. And I'm like, is this an experience that to the rest of the class that a lot of you have? And one of the students lifts her hand and goes, I don't even watch the first 20 minutes of movies anymore. I can't stand the exposition. If I need to know, I'll just catch up with it later. We have this crunching that's happening where everybody needs to try to fit in all of these different things, all this information, all these decisions. And I think when we talk about abundance in this, when we're talking about how we approach information literacy, we have to remember that time is maybe the most important factor in all of this. So abundance is exhausting. Don't face it alone. Good luck today. I hope that your group work works out and I hope you guys have a super good time. I'm not gonna touch that. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, we will let you go and um we will move on in the room. Thanks again. Take care. Bye everybody. Have fun. See you later. Bye.